God. It's good to sing about an everlasting God who have never grows tired or weary, even when we're crawling, <laughs> sometimes walking. He'll help us to soar like eagles. Um, and I don't know what everyone's going through today, but we have an everlasting God. You know, it's good to know, like, no matter, like, we get tired, we give up, we have an everlasting God who has strength and power. So, welcome to New Tree Church. We're going to have some fun today and just worship. By the way, Jose is sick, and uh, so we miss Jose a lot. Um, but some, I'm pulling in, just leading worship today, so I need your help. We're going to have to sing it, sing loud. Right? No, we're not. We can feel it. <laughs> yeah, make a joyful noise. Listen, it, nobody cares how, if you sing bad or whatever, just sing out. <laughs> like you have, man. Just, just go for it. Don't worry about it. All right? And if you hear somebody singing bad around you, just encourage them. Just be like, yeah. You just worship God. You know what I mean? You just worship God. <laughs> Our God, a firm foundation, our rock, the only solid ground. Nations rise and fall. Kingdoms once strong, now shaken. We trust forever in your name. The name of Jesus. The name above all names. Oh, oh, oh. We trust the name of Jesus. You are the only king forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only king forever, forevermore. You are victorious. You are the only king forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only king forever, forevermore. You are victorious. In all your wisdom, in love, in justice, you will reign. Every knee will bow. Oh, yes. One name in all your world. Our hope is anchored in your name. The name of Jesus. Victorious, you are the only king forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only king forever, forevermore. You are You are the only king forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only king forever. Forevermore, you are victorious.
love hearing your voices. It's such an encouragement to hear us all singing together and worshiping God. He's a great God. Is the splendor of the King of glory and majesty and all the earth rejoice let all the earth rejoice for he wraps himself in light in darkness tries to hide trembles at his voice trembles at his how great is our God, sing with me. God here, three in one. Father, Spirit, Son, a lion and the lamb, a lion and the lamb. How great is our God. Sing with me, how great is our God. Oh, we'll see how great, how great is our God. Come on, he's the name above all names. You're the name. One more time, just focus on his greatness. Thank you, Lord. How great is our God? Sing with me. How great is our God? And all will see how great, how great is our God. There's water in the rock, matter in the stone, never on the ground, no matter where I go. I don't need to worry now that I know everything I need you've got. There's honey in the rock. Praying for a miracle, thirsty for the living well. Only you can satisfy Sweetness at the mercy seat I'll taste it, it's not hard to see Only you can satisfy There's honey in the rock There's honey in the rock Honey in the rock 
honey in the rock Freedom where the spirit is Bounty in the wilderness You will always satisfy There's honey in the rock Water in the stone Men are on the ground No matter where I go I don't need to worry Now that I know Everything I need you've got There's honey in the rock Purpose in your plan Power in the blood Healing in your hands Started flowing when you said it is done Everything you did is enough There's honey in the rock I keep looking, I keep finding, you keep giving, you keep providing, I've got all I need, you are all that I need, I keep praying, you keep moving, I keep praising, you keep proving, I've got all I need. finding you keep breathing you keep providing i've got all i need you are all that i need i keep praying you keep moving i keep praising you keep proving i'm all i need you are all that i need yeah there's honey in the rock color in the stone and are on the ground where I go, I don't need to worry now that I know everything I need. You've got there's honey in the rock, purpose in your plan, power in the blood, healing in your hand. Started flowing when you said it is done. Everything you need, enough. There's honey in the rock, there's honey in the rock, there's honey in the rock. Trust in you, Jesus. Oh, how sweet, how sweet it is to trust in you, Jesus. Oh, how sweet, how sweet it is to trust in you, Jesus. Amen. As we prepare our hearts for communion, just thinking about Jesus sacrificing himself on the cross as body and his blood, we always every week take time to remember this moment in history, that it opened up a way for us to have a relationship with God. Just sing the song we'll, as a memory together. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see Beauty that made this heart adore you Hope of a life spent with you So here I am to worship Here I am to bow down Here I am of all days oh so highly exalted glorious in heaven above humbly you came to the earth you created all full of sake became poor here I am so here I am to worship here I am to bow down 
Here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together loving, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. Think about this. And I'll never know how much it cost to see my sin upon that cross. No, I'll never know how much it cost to see my sin upon that cross. No, I. Here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God, you're all together worthy, all together worthy, all together wonderful to I'll never know how much it cost to see my sin upon that cross. I'll never know. Thank you, Jesus. turn our hearts to the cross. Thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice. We look to you for forgiveness, for life, and only you, Lord. Thank you that you provide everything that we need. And Lord, we ask for forgiveness, even for the times that we're not grateful, that we're not thankful, we don't understand how much we've been given. Forgive us for the times we haven't taking care of the things that you've given us and we haven't really stewarded those blessings, Lord. Thank you that it's all enough at the cross. That we can just lay it down there and be forgiven. Thank you, Jesus. As we celebrate your body and your blood right now, would you just let grace flow in this room. Let grace flow to each one of us as we remember you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you can have a seat and our uh, servers are going to pass out the elements. All right, you've been given this. Um, this has a wafer in it, and it has juice. The wafer represents the body of Jesus, and the juice represents the blood. Take a moment, open that up, and get ready, and we're going to take this together as a, as a family. Yeah, there's a little top compartment that opens up. This is a pretty standard communion in 2020. In 2022, it's a little bit harder. It's a little fumbling through it, huh? <laughs> like, oh. And just as a reminder, these are just symbols. We take this understanding the power behind it, but it's just a symbol. Uh, you know, this little wafer doesn't do very much as far as representing a meal that we have with Jesus. But imagine sitting down with Jesus and having a piece of bread that's been torn into pieces like the body of Jesus was torn. 
And then this, uh, like a small cup of juice doesn't really do service to like a glass of wine or something like that, something that would really represent, you know, the blood of Jesus that was poured out for us. But we do this because of the symbolism behind it and the power behind it. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, Paul says, this is a trustworthy saying that deserves all acceptance. In other words, like this is a saying, this is something that sh- should be accepted in the church. It's very, very basic. And he says, this is the, this is the uh, phrase, this is the saying that Christ Jesus died for sinners. That's it. Now, Paul goes on to say, of which I'm the worst sinner, right? <laughs> and, and actually, all of us could put ourselves in that place, right? Because you understand the depth of your sin. The closer you get to Jesus, it's not that you close the gap and fill that debt, the more you realize how much debt there really is to, that he paid for us. So, Jesus Christ gave his life for sinners. And I think sometimes in the church, I hear this a lot from outsiders, you know, from people who are non-believers, We'll look at the church and say, oh, they all think that they're perfect, right? Christians all just think that they're perfect. And oftentimes, my response is something like, actually, it's the exact opposite of that. See, in order to become, be a Christian and be a follower of Christ, you have to admit that you're a sinner, that you're imperfect, like that people are sort of normally just bad, <laughs> and we need a Savior, Right? We need a Savior. Like, that's, that's all we're saying. When you come to Christ and you stand in church, you're just saying, I need a Savior today. This is what this represents. This is what it means for us, that Christ died for sinners. And I know it, sometimes it can be offensive to think of yourself as a sinner. That's okay. Just a little bit. Just, you know, any sort of sin. You don't have to confess it right now out loud. Just think there's got to be something. And, and think a little bit deeper than mispronouncing the name of God. <laughs> like, who cares, Right? Who cares by what you accidentally, uh, you know, we, I saw a video about like, oh, well, Jesus' name was Yeshua. How dare we not use that name? I'm like, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter right now. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about something that's deep, that's in your heart, where you know, I need help with this. We don't come here as perfect people every week. <laughs> we do not. Every day you wake up knowing you're imperfect and I just, you know, I need help. So this is a cry out to God, help me. So let's take the piece, the wafer that represents the body of Jesus, and let's eat this in remembrance of him. Thank you, Jesus, that in your body, you show us the way. It's in your body that's broken for us, that we find escape from the pain and the torture of being separated from you. It's in your body that we're brought close to you. Thank you for that opportunity. Thank you for your giving that, God, yourself, that you closed the gap that could not be closed. Thank you. Let's take the juice together. Thank you for your blood, Jesus. Father, thank you for all that you've done to set us apart, to anoint us, to fill us in our life. Thank you, Spirit, that no matter where we are, you're present, that we have access to you. Thank you for your blood that was shed. Every drop was shed so that we could be forgiven and help us just to receive that in our bodies, in our spirits, in our minds. Everything be cleansed right now of every lie, of every hurt, habit, hang up. God, just let us be completely free of that and clear of that right in this moment, just so that we can get a glimpse of what it's like to be completely forgiven and have a relationship with you. Thank you. In the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. Amen. Such a awesome, it's something that I love doing every single week. It's a very, very important part of what we do. So they're going to come around and pick up the leftover, um, the, the trash and stuff. And then also they have bags if you guys came prepared to give. We don't really, uh, talk a whole lot about giving here, but we are a, a member-supported or a you know, community-supported church. Um, so thank you guys for being generous. Um, it's, we see it as an act of worship. That's why we do it, part of our worship time. Um, I also want to mention a couple things before we bring up John. Um, today, we've got at least one baptism. And 
uh, it seems like uh, once somebody gets baptized, it kind of creates this domino effect, and start, people start saying, like, well, can I do that? So a real quick plug for baptism. Uh, the way we do it here, we don't baptize people to become members of the church, okay? We don't baptize people um, to, you know, for some magic ticket to heaven or something like that. What we baptize people for is people who have decided to put away their old life, to live a new life that's following Jesus. It's a, it's a simple commitment to make, but going underwater, <laughs> is, it's a big deal. And so we, we put people underwater because it's written in the New, Te- New Testament that that's how the church practiced, is connecting with the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. So it's like putting to death those things in our past and rising to a new life. And um, I've, I've gotten some questions over the last few weeks. It's okay to be baptized again if you're baptized at three years old or sprinkled or whatever. Um, we don't really have a whole lot of rules against baptism. So if you want to come get baptized, no questions asked. I mean, we'll baptize you because really it's about you and God. This isn't about being baptized for me or anyone else. There is no human. I don't want to pressure you right now, but there's no human uh, drawing to this. This is all about God drawing this. That's why I don't want to put too much pressure on you. It's just between you and God. So, but we have a baptism today, the baptistry set up. It's ready to go. So after service, if you want to come forward and be baptized, the, the way you come forward, I'm sorry, I said come forward. We won't necessarily have you come forward here unless you want to, um, but we'll just meet outside at the baptistry, okay? Uh, any questions about that? Yes, Kim. Yeah, dude. <laughs> Bring it on. Can I give you a microphone? In October 2020, we returned back to the States from Kuwait. In December, I woke up and I couldn't breathe. And I had blood fluid inside and outside of my lungs, and my heart was operating at 10%. <laughs> I know, I called you to come pick me up. <laughs> so I had an echo two months ago. And by the grace of God, it's operating at 30%. Awesome. Yeah, I don't mind that at all. We need more of that. (laughs) Remember what God's doing. I remember when Ken got baptized, I don't know how many years ago. And uh, yeah, it's been a journey since then, huh? Yeah. Right on. Um. (laughs) Definitely. I love being able to do that stuff. So I'm available if you guys want to pray uh, together. <laughs> uh, anything else <laughs> as far as that goes? I'm, I'll, I'll do that all day. We've got time. <laughs> so, man, when God moves. So if anybody else has to, oh, there we go. Yeah, bring it on. Awesome. That's Sue Stevens and Ron's standing there in the back too. Um, and they, uh, they're leading our Move Africa stuff that we do. So together we all kind of organize and, and administer that. But man, there's been so much generosity. It is amazing. So yeah, to think that a church like this, this size, and could raise half of $65,000 is, is out of this world. So <laughs> definitely. And one thing you could do to help that, by the way, we just sent our wire this last week, which goes to Senyo. We, we support Senyo himself and his whole ministry, his livelihood, and then we also support a number of orphans. Do you guys know that exact number? We're 29 orphans um, among uh, two villages, and that's always open if somebody wants to do that. That's kind of been something that we've done throughout the years, and we also sent money to church planting. He'll go into different villages and plant churches, and then we also pay for field leaders. We pay kind of pay the livelihood to the field leaders and the blessings to those villages where he plants churches. So all that money went out this last week. Um, the wire has been sent, and then we also wired the rest, some more funds for the building construction. And that, I, you know, I've seen construction happen. I don't know if you've ever, ever been around, like, you, you know, if your roads are being constructed, although Sierra Vista is pretty quick, it feels like. But when living in Tucson, it felt like road construction was happening all the time. You're like, can they not get anything done? 
If you see the, uh, the people in Africa right now in Ghana are working their tails off, and it is getting done quick. I am so surprised by that, you know. And a lot of it's, there, it's all local stuff, you know, local contractors, and they're doing it by their plans and everything. So we're just coming behind and supporting them and saying, hey, we want to we wanna see it come to life. We want to see it born. And there's been people who donate in their own church. So one of the things we talked about this week was if all of you just gave $5 on the GoFundMe page <laughs> and then shared it on your Facebook or Twitter, whatever you have, uh, whatever we have now, like six or seven different social media stuff. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Snap it. <laughs> Whatever you do now. <laughs> you used to be tweeting as gramming and then snapping and, you know, tick, tick it, tick tock it, whatever you're going to do. <laughs> My ignorance is showing, but that's okay. <laughs> but if you give $5 and then you have some other people give $5, $5 goes a long way. And there's no fees taken out of that. If you give on GoFundMe, it goes to somewhere good, you know, so you'll see this, we can actually meet that goal pretty easily, especially passing the word around. I think only one other couple, you want to come up and talk? Yeah. <laughs> we'll just let you close off after you're done teaching, you just pray and close us out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Here's Julie, this is my wife, Julie. <laughs> And she's normally downstairs with the kids, and she does a lot of stuff for the Next Generation Ministries. And I wanted her to talk about, sorry, the Next Generation um, <laughs> it's communication. Just, just so you know, it's normal. <laughs> You're not reading my mind. But yeah, the next okay, so on July 23rd, we're having a uh, meeting. It's not really a meeting. Um, we're g it's going to be fun. Um, but we're in need of volunteers. Our children's ministry, COVID's kind of been over now for a while, and our children's ministry is growing, and we need to do some age divisions, and so we're um, requiring uh, more volunteers. Um, our nursery kids are growing, and we need more volunteers in our nursery. Um, preschool's pretty good right now, uh, but nursery downstairs, and we need to get some of our junior hires their own class. Uh, we got six years to 13 in one room, so we need to kind of split that. Um, we also have different areas in the ministry that don't necessarily require you to serve every Sunday, but there's other things that we need help with. So um, if you come on that Saturday, um, we're going to have some snacky things, but we'll be done by lunch, so it's like 9 to 12. And then... Um, we, need, we will have child care if you need it, and there's going to be many opportunities to serve, and part of that also kind of with the welcome team uh, that we're needing. So um, if you're interested, even just a little bit, just come see what we do. Um, also, teens, 13 and up, if you guys, if the kids are interested now, Ava, um, and want to help, there's um, areas to serve as young as 13. So... Um, July 23rd, mm -hmm. here, and it's a Saturday. Yep, childcare and a little bit of, like, snacky things will be available. And lots of fun. Is this isn't going to be a meeting for four hours of, you know, rules and whatever. It's going to be interactive and fun. And uh, to give you an idea of what we do downstairs in the children's ministry. There will be a couple rules, but not a lot. <laughs> cool. Thank you. I knew she would do it much better than I did, so... Um, also, after service today, like to, to this evening, from 4 to 6, is that right? Or 4 to 7, thank you, those of you who've been coming, you know. So every, every Sunday night in, in July, we just have a party. Um, we just kind of hang out. Uh, there's games. We've played cards last time. Um, it'll be kind of, you know. And we totally whooped up. <laughs> we, we really lost badly, but that's okay. <laughs> that's why John's laughing, all right? So you've got to come if you're going to, uh, you know, get to know everybody, kind of rub shoulders, get to talk. Some, sometimes we just sit around and just talk to each other, you know, so it's kind of fun. Be there in person. I think that we provide all the hot dogs, hamburgers, things like that. Bring a side dish and, or something to drink. So with that said, why don't you stand up and greet somebody. Say hi to somebody. Meet somebody new. Hello.
Testing one, two. <clears throat> Good morning, church. I just want to say thank you for the testimonies. Um, I think sometimes that we underestimate the value and the importance of them. We need to hear what God is doing in through you, right? In the, in the book of Revelation, it talks about that, that we've overcome him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. I think that our testimony can inspire people, encourage them, give them strength in, in due season when we're not feeling good, we're not in a good spot. Hearing what God's doing can bring about faith and change in our life. So <clears throat> thank you for that. So um, Exodus 13, um, we're continuing our, our look at um, themes in Exodus and what we can get out of it. Um, what God was trying to get out of the children of Israel. He was getting them out of Egypt, but also getting Egypt out of them. So if you remember, they went into Egypt. Joseph, you know, the purpose of keeping Israel alive during that famine, and they were there. And they were in Egypt for 430 years, and they became slaves under heavy bondage for 430 years. I don't know what it's like to, to be in bondage and slavery like that. Um, I can imagine that it would be disheartening, uh, discouraging, and hearing the stories. I mean, this, this was the, the chosen people, right? This is God promised Abraham, right, that his seed, right, would become a great nation, right? And so I can imagine that as those stories are handed down, they... Would imagine, I would imagine be entertaining the thought of where is God, right? I can imagine that some were born into slavery and died in slavery. Also wondering, where is God during this time? <clears throat> so I want to take a look <clears throat> um, as he is beginning to bring his people out of Egypt that he shows himself and his presence with them. In Exodus chapter 13, verses 21 and 22, says, And the Lord was going before them in a pillar of cloud by day to lead them on the way. Now this is right when, this is right after the Passover. Pharaoh had had enough. Get out. Firstborn, gone. They want them out right now, right? And so that's why the, the unleavened bread, because they had to leave in haste. Get out right now. Get out, right? Their neighbors gave them articles of silver and clothing as possessions, but as they're leaving, this is where we're picking up the story. And he's leading them a cloud by day to lead them on the way and in a pillar of fire by night to give them light so that they might travel by day and by night. Verse 22, he did not take away the pillar of cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night from the presence of the children of Israel. So here he is, he's going to lead them by this pillar of cloud, right? He's going to lead them and demonstrate to them, I'm with you. I'm here, I'm present, and I'm going to lead you. And he did not take away this cloud. So they always had this idea that he was with them, right? Because remember, they were slaves for many, many years. Probably wondering where he is. If we're supposed to be a chosen nation, where is he? So he's demonstrating to them that he is present in this pillar of cloud. And in Exodus 14, verses 19 and 20, um, he's going to part the Red Sea. And it shows that he has his part. The angel of the Lord stood between Israel and the enemy. The cloud was between the camps. He made a way through the water for them to escape. So he's still present. Not only is he present, now he puts himself in between his people and the enemy. Right? Very dark. No one, no one came through the, through the camp <clears throat> from those camps. He parted the Red Sea and they were able to walk through, right? They, their back was against the sea. No option. The Lord has to do something. 
Then as they journeyed, they didn't have water. He provided them water. They didn't have food. He provided them food. They got tired of eating bread, so he gave them quail for food. And as they made their way to Mount Sinai, they stayed there, and he began to speak to Moses. The cloud is still there, present before them, right? Settled right there. They don't move. He's there. He begins to speak to Moses and begins to give them certain laws and, and things to follow. In Exodus 25, he says, <clears throat> Have them construct a sanctuary for me so that I may dwell among them. Verse 9, according to all that I'm going to show you, as the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the furniture, so you shall construct it. Now that word tabernacle, <clears throat> it really just means dwelling place, right? This is the place that he's going to dwell, right? He's not always just going to be the pillar of cloud. Now he's going to dwell in the tabernacle, right? That dwelling place, the, the tent of meetings as it is. And um, in Exodus 26.33, there's a veil between the holy place and the most holy. It says, you shall hang up the veil under the clasp and bring in the ark of the testimony there within the veil, and the veil shall serve as a partition for you between the holy place and the most holy. So here is where God is going to dwell, in the tabernacle, in the, in the holy of holies, right? The most holy place. And then when they finally got the, the tent made, they, colorful, they had a bunch of people, you know, making some things for it, very colorful. When they finally got it done and Moses um, got all the furniture together, it says that the cloud covered and his glory filled the tabernacle. This is where God was dwelling and he has his presence there among the people. He's always there. Then as they go on, they journey, they finally get into the promised land. King David wanted to build God a house. And the Lord said, I don't want you to do it, I want your son to do it. So David got the plans, he got all the material together, and his son Solomon built the temple. And in 2 Chronicles chapter 5, um, it talks about when they finished it, that the cloud filled the temple. And this temple also had a veil to separate the most holy where he dwells, his presence among the people. And in John chapter 1, verse 14, it says that he dwelt among us, right? The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld him, right? And this word dwelt is... Uh, it literally means to dwell as in a tent, to encamp, have my tabernacle. So here, God is walking amongst us to dwell amongst us. He's going to tabernacle with us, as it were, right? I'm just trying to illustrate and, and point a picture of how he's, he's present from that, that point how he has always made a way to present himself as present before you. And in, uh, when, when Jesus was crucified in Matthew 27, it says the veil was torn. The separation between the most holy and the holy, right, separating where he was, is now torn, signifying we no longer have to go, and there's no longer a partition between us, we have direct access to him. And John chapter 14 says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, so that he may be with you forever. The helper is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him. But you know him because he remains with you and will be in you. So all the way from Exodus to present day, God is with us. So this is 
If you don't know Christ, this is the good news of the gospel. He's not far away. We don't have to travel to some particular building in some particular city in some particular country to meet him. He's present with you. He abides in you today to demonstrate his presence with you. So I said all of that to say this, that sometimes in our journey with him, we are faced with difficulties where it may not feel good. It may feel like we're in the wilderness, where things are not happening like we thought they would, not as smooth as we hoped. I seem to be learning the hard way, making mistakes and hurting people along the way. He's not as vocal as I would like him to be. There seems to be times where he's silent. And there are times when I feel dry. Can anybody identify with this? So once you come to Christ, everything's great. You're forgiven, right? And that's good. That's, but as the more that you follow along that journey... There are things that he wants to teach us. There are things that he wants to bring out of us, right, that he has to deal with. But his presence is always with us. We can always take heart in that. But there are times in life where it's very difficult. It can be difficult. It can feel alone. Even with brothers and sisters in the church, they may not fully understand and grasp what it is you're going through. And sometimes that's by design. Right? He has his ways of working in us. And it's not always pleasant. It doesn't always feel good. right? But rest assured that he has your best interest in mind. Sometimes we might answer, why doesn't he answer me? I've asked him for whatever direction, fill in the blank of whatever he's not answering. And there are probably many, many reasons for him that he might be silent for a time. Let us go through things for a time. There's no way that you can exhaust the reasons. So I'll just take a look at a couple of them. Difficulties Difficult times make us better. They make us better. I know that it doesn't sound right, but it's in those difficult times that we dig deeper into him, that he begins to teach us things, that he begins to show us areas of our own life that we need to grow, that we need to change, that we need to face. Romans chapter 5 says that, uh, uh, verse 3 says that, and not only this, but we also celebrate in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance, proven character, and proven character, hope. So I would remind us that it's our character is the basis of which we are qualified. It's not your ability. You may be very gifted in certain areas, but that's not the basis of which you're qualified. You're qualified based on your character. Character, good character, comes from <coughs> perseverance through the difficult times. When things start hitting the fan, are you, do you have integrity? And are you resolute in your, your servitude to him? Because in those times, it's very difficult to abandon ship, right? It would be very easy just to, you know what, this, I was told, you know, God has this great and wonderful plan for me, and he does. That's the truth. But to get to that end of great and wonderful plan, he has to do some things in us. He has to prepare us, right? Because most of us are not born ready. Our character is flawed. We have areas in our life that we need to address. There are things that we have to look at. 
I understand it's very sobering, right? But it's the truth. He's present, but there are times, and I just want to speak to those times where it can be very difficult, right? And I just want to let you know that he has your best interest in mind. Whatever the trial, whatever the tribulation, he has a plan for it. If God were to give you everything immediately, what would that make us? Out character, I would say a spoiled brat. How many of us do that for our kids? Hey, I want this, yeah, yeah, I want this, yeah, yeah. And then we'd end up with some spoiled brats, right? And then what would that make God? Would that make him our genie? Lord, I need a, right? And then, boom, he does it, right? As if he's our butler. He's waiting on every beck and call. Hey, Lord, hey, Lord, right? We would be spoiled brats with no character, no integrity, and it would make him just, hey, he's a genie. He's not God Almighty. He's just, hey, I wish to have this. Let me rub the lamp. Mm -hmm. There's a quote by um, G. Michael Hoff. Hard times create strong men. Strong men create good times. Good times create weak men. And weak men create good hard times. It's a cycle. Think about where we're at. And if that be true, think about how God wants to make strong people, strong warriors for him. Would he be able to do that in good times? Now, I'm not trying to say that God doesn't do good things and provide good for us. I'm just trying to address those times where it feels like we're in the wilderness and we're wondering, where is he? It's been said that a sword is not made on a hammock. It's made on an anvil. And you think about that raw steel, right? If we are the steel of which he's going to make a sword, think about the steel itself or any precious metal, what it would take to get it that way. When you dig it out of the earth, it's not pure. It has to be thrown into the fire, heated up, so that all the imperfections are separated so that we can get with just the raw material. <clears throat> then, after that's taken place, then I'm going to take this raw steel, put it back in the fire, heat it up, put it on the anvil, and begin to hammer that thing to what I want it to be like. Hammer it. And it's only hot for so long, and it cools off. Then, right back in the fire. Back on the anvil. Pound after Pound after pound. You and I both know that we want to be that sword in his hand. We want to be and desire to be useful in the hand of Almighty. But friend, I can tell you that if you were going to be that, there's going to be some time where he's going to refine you. And I can tell you it's not going to be pleasant. People around you may not be able to identify exactly what's going on. That's okay. They don't have to, right? I would encourage you to remain in the fire. Allow him to work and pound whatever it is in us. It's not a pleasant feeling, but I can tell you in the end, you will be a vessel of honor, a tool, a mighty tool in the hand of Almighty. But you have to remain on the anvil. You have to remain on the potter's wheel, right? Because they take that lump of clay and they just slam it on that wheel and then begin to shape it, right? I'm not a potter, but I get the idea. You know, I, can, I could probably identify with uh, forming this thing and then falling it down. It was marred. But in the hands of the master, 
He can get it soft again. But we have to remain on the wheel. We cannot check out of the process. If you check out of the process, when you, when you come back into the vicinity of Almighty and you begin to walk with him again, you know the very thing that he's going to want to talk to you about? Hey, let's talk about that potter's wheel. Remember when you bailed and I was heating you up on the anvil and beating, remember? Right? And we can go around the mountain again and make, oh, I don't go again, right? Always to that place. Moses, you know, brought up in Egypt as Pharaoh's um, daughter's son, right? He killed a man in haste because he identified with the Egyptians and they were putting the hurtings on his fellow kinsmen. And it became known and he had to flee the scene. And he fled to Midian. And he was in Midian for 40 years. 40 years, exiled, or in the training ground, in the proving ground, right? Because think about this. If God's going to use this man to bring his people out, he needs some training. And what was Moses doing? He was a shepherd. And God needed a shepherd to bring his people out because his people are not smart sometimes. We make dumb decisions over and over again and you need a shepherd. Sometimes the shepherd has to take the staff and get your attention, right? But Moses was in training for 40 years. He had two sons and, and the names of his son indicates to me where his mind was. His firstborn, Gershom. I have been a stranger in a foreign land. Now, was he talking about Midian or was he talking about Egypt? Or both? Because Egypt wasn't his land and neither was Midian. And then his second son, Eliezer, the God of my father has my help, was my help, and saved me from the sword of Pharaoh. Think about, I mean, he never gave up he, he knew the God of his father. I think all of them did. And wondering, where is he? Now, he's in Midian for 40 years wondering, I'm, I would imagine, am I going to see my family again? What's the purpose of me being out here? I'm exiled. I'm, I'm toast. I'm done. And that's when the Lord met him. Israel wandered because of their disobedience, but like Christ... They learned obedience through the things they suffered. If this was for Christ, it's going to be for us. There are times in life that we're going to have to face. We can always be resolute that he is with us and that he has a purpose for it. It may not feel good, acknowledged. I acknowledge Jesus himself was tempted in the wilderness. And you and I will be the same. It's life's proving ground. And then in Revelations, he says that he wrote to the churches, he said at the end of those letters to each church, to him who overcomes, I will give, eat of the tree of life, not be hurt by the second death, a new name. Why would he say to him who overcomes? He's already overcome, right? He's overcome. But there are things in life that we have to address, that we have to face. He chastises the son that he loves. If he didn't chastise us, he wouldn't love us. That's the mark of a son, right? There are times that he needs to get our attention. And what about the times when we feel he's silent? Could it be that he's getting your attention? What if we're not ready to hear it? What if you're asking for something and he's not giving you whether you should do it or not? What if you have liberty that what he's going to do in you is not bearing on this decision? So you might have liberty. 
What if he already spoke? He should not have to speak twice. That'd be kind of strange. Let there be light. I said, let there be light. Right? If he's already spoken it to us, but we don't like the answer, come ask again. Ask again. Has he already spoken it? In <clears throat> is he trying to teach us to discern his voice? Because in this day and age, there are a lot of things competing for your attention. Tons of stuff that would love to have not some or most, but all of your attention. Do you guys remember Elijah when he was um, running and he was in the cave? And he was like, oh, Lord, I, I just give up, right? Jezebel told him, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do to you what you've done to these priests of Baal, you know, by this time tomorrow. And he ran, right? And there was a big whirlwind, but the whirlwind wasn't in it. There was a bunch of different things happening, big, large-scale stuff, but he wasn't in those. He was in that still, small voice. He doesn't always speak with that, but we have to discern his voice. Sometimes he speaks softly. And if we're too busy running around and competing with, uh, what was the app, Snap something? <laughs> Whatever your fa flavor of social media you know, is consuming all your time, are you able to discern what he is saying? And sometimes he just might want to see what you're going to do. In Finding Nemo, they were on the uh, East Australian Current, and they were playing the games, and the little turtle squirt was kicked out, flew out of the current, and his dad said, because Marlon was going to go get him, whoa, 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 kill the motor. Let us see what squirt does flying solo. Sometimes he might be wanting to see what you will do. Sometimes it's, we just have to step out in faith. Well, what if I make mistakes? <sighs> Join the club. Welcome. Come, come on in. Mistakes will be made. And that's where we need to extend grace to one another because we're all going to make mistakes. It's a learning process, and sometimes that's the only way we can learn, is making mistakes. We have to. It's the only way we're going to learn. So that's where we extend grace to one another. We make a mistake, right? Not, I'm not trying to make excuse or downplay mistakes, right? Yes, you hurt somebody, make it right, but that's where we extend grace to one another, right? Mistakes will be made. In Luke... <clears throat> they were asking him, how, how do we pray? Oh, sorry, this one. And he, said, and he said to them, suppose one of you has a friend and goes to him at midnight and says to him, friend, lend me three loaves because a friend of mine has come to me from a journey and I have nothing to serve him. And from inside, he answers and says, do not bother me. The door has already been shut, and my children and I are in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, even if he will not get up and give him anything just because he is his friend, yet because of his shamelessness, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. It's a parable of how we approach Right? Lord? No answer. Lord? 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 This comes from Jesus. That's what he said. Shamelessly. Oh, let me go down here and see what this boy needs. My gosh. Right? 
Sometimes that's what's required. You ask, he's not, I don't, nothing. What are you going to do? I'm going to go back to his door and I'm going to knock some more. And I'm going to knock and I'm going to knock and I'm going to knock. He wants warriors of all kinds. Ones that know how to fight. Ones that will lean forward. Now, when I say warriors, it's easy to imagine men fighting on a battlefield somewhere. But I would bring to your attention and remind that there's some ladies in here that are some powerful prayer warriors. There's two things I want to say to that. One is the effective, fervent prayer of the righteous avails much. Keep on praying. Please don't stop praying. And two, you never go up against a praying mom when death is on the line. <laughs> don't do it. So I would encourage you prayer warriors, you keep praying. Keep praying. And if you, you don't have an answer, keep knocking. Keep seeking. Because some only go out by prayer and fasting. When Jesus gave authority to the disciples to go, to preach, to heal, remember they couldn't heal all of them? He brought his son. They couldn't do it. Some of this only goes out by prayer and fasting. There are strongholds in life that we have to pray and fast about to get to see breakthrough. Right? And in this training ground, he's teaching us something. He's teaching us to press in. Right? He's teaching it. How many times do we approach him just, just from being thankful and not wanting something or in need? Is this the only time that we reach out to God is when we need something, when we're desperate, when we're wanting something, some direction? Hebrews 11 says that he, if we come to him, we must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So if, you're, if your only time to, is to reach out to him in difficulty, and he wants you to reach out to him. He wants you to communicate with him. Do you see the equation? The only time he reaches out to me is bad times or when he needs something. And I do want him to reach out for me. So what's his incentive not to give you more bad times? If that's your only time to reach out to him. Think about that for a moment. Right? So sometimes we just need to reach out and commune with him because we love him. He is the prize. He's the prize, not what he has, not what he can do for us, but he is the prize. And the bitter truth is that sometimes we may never, we may never understand why. That's the truth. There are things in life that we cannot explain. He does things for his own purposes that we cannot explain. We may not know. We may go through something, fill in the blank, and we may not understand why. And we may go to our grave not knowing why. That's the raw truth. In Isaiah chapter 55, says that for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts your thoughts. Israel was in Egypt for 430 years. Some born, died in slavery. Why? Genesis chapter 15, he gives a clue as to why. He told Abram that his family would be 
in bondage for 400 years, but that he would judge the nation, that they would be blessed coming out with possessions, and the, for the wrong doing of the Amorite was not yet complete. That's a tough pill to swallow. That's the truth. That's a tough pill. They were in slavery because he had to do some other things. He had to give the Amorite time to repent. He knew they weren't, but he had to give them time, as he gives us time. He was going to judge the nation. He was going to judge Egypt. And if I could add one, he was going to demonstrate to the world, not only Israel and Egypt, but to the world, who he is. Because it was going to be such a powerful exodus that the world was going to know who he is. He had to let the world know who he was. But think about if you were one of the... Israel's enslaved, having to be enslaved for such a time as him having to demonstrate to the world. That's a tough pill. So what I'm suggesting to you is sometimes that we go through things. We don't know the reason. He has his sovereign reasons, but it could very well be that he's going to use a life laid down so that he may reach others. When they came out of Egypt, the inhabitants were fearful. They got to Canaan, and they were, they were knocking their knees. They were, they were trembling at what God had done for them. Right? The world knew now who he was and who his people were. Right? And you think about the people that may have come to, come to know him because of that. Right? Right? This area, like one of the people that were, they were going to take over were the Hittites. Right? That was one of the people. One of David's mighty men was Uriah the Hittite. Do you guys remember the story of Bathsheba? That was her husband. A mighty man of David. A mighty man fighting for Israel, but he was a Hittite fighting for Israel. Right? The queen of Sheba came to Solomon. They were well aware of who the Lord was and who his people were. Naaman the leper came to get healed. And the Ethiopian eunuch, whom Philip was caught up and because he was reading Isaiah, didn't, didn't quite understand it. Right? All of these people knew who the Lord was through this. So he accomplishes his mission and purpose through our lives. We have to surrender. And what I'm suggesting to you is that sometimes in life, when times are tough and we don't quite understand, you can rest assured that he's with you and that it's meaningful to some level and degree you may not understand Take a look at my man, Job. I believe Job is an illustration of God demonstrating some things to the enemy of our soul, to the heavenlies. Men are made just a little lower than the angels, right? We don't get to see God, right? They can come into the presence of him, but not us. We wouldn't be able to handle it, right? But he is demonstrating what a man will do. He won't curse me. And he put him through a whole bunch of stuff for the purpose that Job could not see. He could not understand. He could not understand it. And sometimes we may be going through things for the purpose of God demonstrating to the heavenlies. That's my boy. That's my daughter right there, right? Doesn't look like that, but as it's unfolding, 
How do you know that Almighty's up, not up there? That's my boy. That's my servant. At some point, we just have to cross the bridge. Either he is God or he is not. Either I'm his servant or I'm free to do whatever I want to do. I don't know him to be completely silent in life. I can just tell you that there are tough times as we've seen Israel to go through tough times, but he is with you always. You can take that to heart. So my final question to you is, everything that he's done for you freed us from sin, put us in right standing with God, dwelling among us here, is that enough? Is it enough? Is what he's already done sufficient? It's a sobering thought, I know, acknowledged. It's very, very sobering. But it's, it's the truth. If you've spent any time with Almighty for any length of time, you're going to have those moments. And I would encourage you, with everything I have, press in. Press into him. Don't take offense at his ways, because his ways are different than ours. Don't take offense. But Lord, you didn't, you didn't do this. You didn't do that. You didn't speak. Don't take offense. Right? It's a very sobering message, and I would encourage you, just press in. What he's done for us is sufficient. It is sufficient. Amen? Amen. Get out. Get out. <laughs> right? Absolutely. Absolutely. So with that in mind, we do have some baptisms. Um, Jesse had mentioned anyone wants to come up and declare their faith before baptized. If not, I'll pray for us and we will rendezvous at the baptismal. Lord, we just thank you for today and just ask that you be with us and that you would overshadow those that have come forward and want to be baptized, Lord, I just pray a blessing upon them. Um, I thank you for the testimony of Ken and his heart, Lord. I just lift him up now and his heart, Lord, that you would continue to heal his heart and that we would hear another testimony soon of it, the, the percentage increasing. We just lift up Africa uh, what you're doing in Senyo in that village, Lord, that you would continue to pour out blessing uh, upon them, Lord, as they do the work of you, Lord. We just ask this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.